All right, the port function in Bloomberg can also be used to do risk analysis. So before I showed you return analysis in a prior video, let's check out risk analysis. So we type in P-O-R-T, and this is really good for any portfolio risk team. Uh, and this comes up you know, initially in Bloomberg demo. Uh, we're gonna leave that workspace there. I'm gonna grab tracking air volatility, TEV, so this button right here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is put in my portfolio, which I've created the Wilcox Investment Fund. I did that in PRTU. I've shown that to you in a prior video, how to create a custom portfolio. I also created my own custom S&P 400 index. So I'm going to grab that too. And uh, the other thing I want to look at, some of these other options here, the model version, I want to use the MAC3 equity. This is an equity fund. MAC3 equity is a Bloomberg risk model version and I want to look at a single asset class. It's a single asset class model. It's global equity. So I'm going to grab that as well. And I'm just going to hit apply and reload while I do that. And it's going to take a minute to calculate everything. So I'll be back in a sec. All right. That took about call it 45 seconds to calculate. And now we're here on this screen. So this is a nice big picture overview of our fund. We have total active risk of 5.04%. What does that mean? So this is an ex ante view. So it's a forecasted view of what our active risk is going to be, 5.04%. That means a one standard deviation move, plus or minus, we should expect a 5% difference, 5.04% difference than what we expect. Let's say we expect to perform right in line with the index. So I have a 0% excess return. Then we would say a one standard deviation difference is 5.04%. So, you know, 68% of our observations should be plus or minus about 5% relative to the benchmark in standard deviation space. This level of active risk is a level that you need to be comfortable with, with regard to your strategy. We like it for this fund. That's about in line with what we expect. Um, if it was too high, we'd have to make some trades to reduce that risk. And uh, But we don't have to do that right now. We're comfortable with this level of active risk. And it's in line with what a lot of active managers in the industry run their portfolios at. <clears throat> now, that is comprised of factor risk and idiosyncratic risk. This is a stock selection fund. So therefore, we want most of our risk to be focused on idiosyncratic stock-specific risk. So we like this. We want to make sure that we're taking the right bets and we're not betting on things that we can't forecast. What are the things we can't forecast are things like style risk, which I'll explain in a little bit. Industries, we're not really good at forecasting industries. Currency, country, market, these are things we don't want to forecast. So we want to neutralize ourselves to the extent we can. <clears throat> we do have some sector bets here. Industrials is our biggest one and healthcare. So we got to, you know, make, you know, if we're not comfortable with where we're at, we want to limit, uh, narrow those bets a little bit. But, you know, again, our, our overall factor risk, which is comprised of partially industry risk, pretty small. Our biggest contributions to tracking your volatility by position, tenant healthcare. Tenant healthcare is your biggest bet in this portfolio, as is AutoNation. Because tenant healthcare is our biggest bet, we better be pretty confident in that stock. You know, um, we we like it, you know, but if we were sort of lukewarm on it, we might want to trim that because that's adding a lot to our risk. These bets here, along with all the other stocks in our portfolio, if I added them up, they're going to add up to more than 89.05%. So they don't add up. You can't really add volatilities. One of the reasons you can't add volatilities is because they might be negatively correlated with each other. For example, ten, an overweight to tenant healthcare might be offsetting a, an overweight to auto nation. And so because of, you know, the whole principle of diversification and idiosyncratic risk gets diversified as you add more and more positions to a portfolio, as you add these up, they're going to add up to more than 89.05% of the total contribution to tracking your volatility. All right. So the factors, um, if I want to drill down, these are groups of factors. So within style, there's a handful of other factors. So for example, within style, you're going to see earnings yield. You're going to see valuation. You're actually even going to see momentum. All right. So we're overweight. We've got a positive number here. That means we are overweight earnings yield and we're overweight value. So in other words, we have a cheaper portfolio than the benchmark based on earnings yield and based on valuation. Momentum, we have a negative bet of momentum. We're slightly underweight momentum. What does that mean? That means the stocks in our portfolio over the past year, our current stocks over the past year, have not gone up as much as the overall market has gone up. The S&P 400 stocks have gone up. 
Now that could be a good thing. Maybe we bought a bunch of stocks that have just fallen a lot. And so we have a negative bet on momentum. But the problem is on momentum is momentum stocks, both positive and negative momentum stocks tend to co-move with each other. And uh, those movements can be very strong. So you generally don't want to have big bets on momentum because it is a risky factor. As a standalone factor, it's pretty risky. It's riskier than valuation. It's riskier than earnings yield as a standalone factor. But our exposure to it is small. So our exposure kind of, if you kind of think about this number here is sort of like multiplying active exposure by volatility. The problem is you can't totally multiply them because this is in standard deviation space. This is in standard deviation space. And, you know, you just, it's hard to do things like this um, directly, but this gives you an idea that momentum is a risk, but it's not huge. It's 0.64%, you know, of our total risk. 0.64% of this 5.04. It's not really big. Again, you can't add all these up. They don't add up because of, because of the negative correlations, but, uh, or the low correlations, but it gives you an idea of what your biggest bets are. So we definitely have a little bit of an earnings yield and valuation bet. That's something we may want to monitor, monitor. If we think that value stocks or earnings yield stocks are going to underperform systematically, we might want to mitigate that risk a little bit. Um, so over here, AutoNation, is a bigger bet than tenant healthcare. But again, on a standalone basis, AutoNation is less risky. It has less idiosyncratic risk than, than uh, tenant healthcare does. And so therefore, the contribution to our total idiosyncratic risk is lower for AutoNation. But it's still one of our bigger stocks. What you want to make sure, again, is that you're betting on things that you think you can forecast. We like these stocks. Tenant, AutoNation, Sterling, Harmony, Biosciences, Innovative. We like these stocks. We're overweight these stocks. Um, we're actually underweight this stock. So here's an interesting one. We we don't own Vistra, but Vistra is a very volatile stock and we have a big underweight to it. So we better make sure you know, we're betting against it, right? Even though we don't have a position in it, we actually have a position in it. We're betting against it relative to the market. So we better make sure that we know about this stock and maybe, you know, I should assign that to one of our analysts to take a look at it and make sure we have an opinion on that stock. Okay, so that's how you analyze uh, these things. You can do, uh, you can drill down into factor risk, for example. So within equity, you can click on this, and we did this a little bit earlier, but you can look at um, some of these earnings within earn within uh, style. There's earnings yield, there's value, there's momentum. These are the big factors that they have: variability, leverage, size, beta. So size. We have a small portfolio. It's minus two point five four standard deviations left of the average stock in the universe. That's because these are mid-cap stocks, so they should be smaller. The benchmark is also smaller, but we're smaller than the benchmark. We're 0.24 standard deviations smaller than the kind of average market cap of the benchmark. That's pretty small. I'm not worried about a size bet here. We don't have a big size bet. Our beta bet, and this is all in standard deviation space, the the we have a little, the benchmark is a little bit higher beta than the average beta of the average stock in the universe. And when I say the universe, I'm talking about all stocks in the U.S. And <clears throat> so the benchmark is a little higher. We're a little even higher, but our difference is small. Rounded, it's 0.04 in standard deviation space, small beta bet. We're not taking a big beta bet here. We're not taking big bets anywhere, to be honest with you. All these are small bets. If I'm looking over here on the right side, I'm good with this. I'm good with our systematic risk. It's pretty small currency. So we're good. I like how this portfolio is positioned. If I want to drill down into idiosyncratic risk, the nice thing is it breaks it up by in, by by sector. So I can go through our industrials here, for example, starts off with industrials. We have a 5% underweight to industrials. So I think our current position is something like 16% and the market is like 21. So we're underweight uh, industrials, but these are our biggest single stock risks. So we have a large overweight to Sterling Infrastructures and Generac, Atcor, Huntington Ingalls, ArcBest. These are all overweight positions, but we can even get down here to our underweight positions. So we have an underweight to Expo, and that's actually, that underweight, 60 basis points, is causing a lot of risk. Not a lot. It's causing some risk as well. So obviously the stocks that we have big positions in are causing the most risk, but the stocks that we have underweights in, we got to be mindful of those too, because they cause risk as well. And these are all, so it gives you all of those. So I go through all of these and then I go down to the next sector, which is healthcare, and I can pull all those up. And so, you know, there are, there are quite a few different things you can look at. 
So ultimately, a couple things as I, I leave this for you. When you're analyzing risk, you want to make sure your total active risk is in line. This is a forecast based on this risk model here. You want to make sure that you're betting on what you think you have knowledge in. If you're a stock selection fund, then you want to have most of your risk in idiosyncratic risk, and you want to have very little in factor risk. If you're a quant manager and you want to forecast things like momentum and you want to forecast things like you know earnings yield, then maybe you want to have more in factor risk. Okay, We like where we're positioned here. You want to make sure that your largest factor positions, you can live with these, this level of risk and that you have strongest confidence in these names here in terms of their outperformance. If that's not the case, then maybe you want to rebalance and change the way your portfolio looks. This is all really good uh, information. So the last thing you do, you can create custom columns and you can look at historical. Let's pull up historical. This gives us our current risk, but you know, this is end of month. You know, I could do end of quarter, end of year, last week, end of day. I can actually pull up a custom date. So if I just want to go to, let's say, how, how are we positioned, you know, back in, grab like, so here I'm grabbing March 12th and I just want to see how, you know, perform there. So back in March, we only had 4.82% active risk. And so you can kind of see what's changed. You know, we had bigger bets on Adcor super micro back then. We actually sold out of that position and um, our style and industry still, still seem to kind of be in the same general area. So we haven't really changed the portfolio. The relationship between factor and idiosyncratic hasn't changed all that much, but this is kind of nice. This is our overall beta, 1.02, 1.05. So we've trimmed our beta exposure a little bit. So this is kind of nice to just kind of look at a portfolio through time and how it may have changed. All right. So I hope this gives you enough to go on. Um, if you're a risk team, this is really powerful to analyze the risks, make sure the portfolio is in line with what you think it's supposed to be doing. Um, great for student managed investment funds. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel and give me some comments too. What kind of videos do you want to see from me? Because this is where I make finance fun for students. Thank you.